Welcome back to the Side Bet Podcast. With me today, I have former press secretary for the governor of Nevada. I have senior crime reporter at gambling.com. He writes columns for the Mom Museum. I could go on and on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Henry. Larry, welcome to the show, brother. How are you doing today? Doing great, man. Thanks so much for having me on. I really do appreciate it. It's great seeing you. I'm a, I'm a huge admirer of your show, and I'm honored to be on it. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure getting to know you. Uh, man, I've been looking forward to this talk for quite some time, Larry. And just to give some people a background who don't know you, give, a little, give people a background on who you are and how you got started in uh, crime reporting. Well, you know, it, it's really funny, but it goes way back. The whole crime reporting experience goes back to uh, I got a job at the, at the Tulsa World newspaper north of uh north of uh of texas over the red river in, in tulsa and uh covered cops man i loved it i got the job because i'd been in the marine corps and so the, the city editor said hey man you know a lot of these cops are jarheads and and you know so you you, you you'll get and man i loved it i was uh it was it was it was uh you know a lot of action a lot of you know um heavy duty uh I, I was out of the newsroom a lot i've always loved newsrooms i love the kind of people who work in newsrooms they're real curious they hold powerful people accountable they really want to stand up for the little person always loved all that but i also loved going out riding with cops man that was back in the day where you could ride with cops they would you could go with them to crime scenes and got to know you, you know a lot of people on both sides of the law man i had sources who were cops i had sources who were on the other side um, sometimes you don't know who's on what side, but you know, it's a, but, but so I, so that evolved. Then I got a job out in Reno, um, at a news, I've all, you know, been in newspapers and I, and I got a job there and down in Las Vegas and, and, and that's sort of how it evolved. And they started out just loving journalism, loving newspaper work. Wow. And, and I'm glad you, you brought up when you landed in Reno, looking up history of gambling, it does seem to me that it started more so in Reno than it did, than it did Vegas. Or it am really, I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. In fact, around the country, Hot Springs, Arkansas, down in South Florida, as you know, Renee, up by uh, Cincinnati, across the Ohio River, Newport, Covington, that area, a lot of the, there were a lot of illegal gambling joints, a lot of stuff in Texas, you know, the Doyle Brunsons, all those <clears throat> Texas poker players. I think poker started around, uh, Texas Hold'em started around Corpus Christi back in the day. A lot of so a lot there were a lot of illegal up in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. There were a lot of illegal gambling halls, and Benny Binion ran a joint in in downtown Dallas before he got run out and went to went to Las Vegas at the Horseshoe. So yeah, so Reno in thirty one Vegas wasn't even really it, it was there, but it wasn't really a big gaming metropolis uh, until later years. But when when gaming was legalized in thirty one. Reno was was sort of the place in, in Nevada. You know, a lot of people went out there for quickie divorces. It wasn't far from Carson City, the capital. So it was really sort of the big place before Vegas took off. And why do you think Reno before Vegas took off? Well, because Vegas at that point was sort of a railroad stop. You know, you had Fremont Street down. You know Las Vegas inside now, Renee. It was sort of a railroad stop with Fremont Street um, in, in southern Nevada. That's really why it was there between Salt Lake and, and L.A., Las Vegas was kind of a stop stopover. Reno had been there longer, um, had been there a longer time. Renee, it was a uh, it was a uh, an established community. The guy who invented Levi uh, Levi pant the blue jeans, he had a there's uh, I think that was actually started in Reno because of the mines up in Virginia City. Uh, all of that, a lot of the miners in the eighteen the San Francisco 49ers because of the 1849 gold rush. So all those people, Reno was right in the middle of the, all that. And so all those mines up in Virginia city, the silver mines, Virginia city, as you know, is just right outside of Reno. So all that was a big mining area back in the 1800s. And so much more established before Las Vegas began to take off. Now, obviously the tables are turned and Las Vegas is the big gaming metropolis. And when Reno took off, was the mob involved? Yeah, uh, there were there were underworld figures in Reno um, who who controlled downtown Reno, uh, the the gambling properties. And then you also, by the way, I'm glad you asked that because one of the sort of I was just talking to a friend of mine, Brendan Riley, who was an AP reporter in Carson City when I covered the legislature in Carson City for the Reno newspaper. 
he, he and I were talking the other day about he 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 writes a column about Vallejo, California. And we were talking about how, uh, you know, back in those days, not just sort of like uh, uh, Sicilian mobsters, but but there were some of those old school Depression era uh, uh, Midwest, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas type gangsters out there. Babyface Nelson lived there for a while. A lot of them went out there to hide. Now, they're not mobsters in the traditional sense. But there were those old Depression era gangsters went out to Reno and sort of hid out and could, because you could gamble. And, and they were protected by some of those uh, powerful forces who kind of controlled the town. So, yeah, it, it really was sort of a uh, the underworld's always had a hand in Reno back in the day. Now it's all corporate and all that. But back in the day, the underworld had a big hand in Reno. And and the lake, by the way, I don't mean to mean to cut you off, but up at Lake Tahoe. Let me and and I apologize for cutting you off, but up at Lake Tahoe, which is right outside of Reno, the Cal Neva on the north shore of Lake Tahoe. Now, so as you know, the 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 California Nevada border kind of cuts the lake in two. On the north shore, the Cal Neva, and there's some talk about reviving it. It was owned by Frank Sinatra, Sam G. and Kana, the Chicago mobster, had a piece of it secretly had a piece of it and he would hang out there. And that's what got Sinatra in trouble, by the way, because Giancana would hang out there where Phyllis McGuire was his girlfriend when they would play there. So, and you had a lot of the Kennedys, Marilyn Monroe, all that crowd hung out at the Cal Neva. So yeah, there's always been a little, uh, a little uh, sort of underworld aspect to the Northern Nevada, you know, not like Las Vegas became, but there always was a little bit of an underworld aspect up there. And speaking of what Vegas became, it really took off when the Chicago underworld, so to speak, sent what we know as the movie Casino. Yeah. Uh, you know, Tony Spilatro and uh, Leslie Rosenthal kind of changed the game out there. Uh, tell, tell everybody a little bit about what you understand about what happened with the growth and the downfall to Vegas in that time era. Well, that was a part of it, what you just said, Renee. The, uh... You know, as as Nicholas Pelleggi wrote in the book Casino, and became the movie as you referenced with with uh, with uh, Joe Pesci and 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 De Niro and Sharon Stone, which really covered an era that was really big from the late '60s into the '80s. That was that really violent Chicago mob era. But even before then, way back around world after 1931, when when gaming became legal. Fremont Street in downtown Las Vegas really was the place. There were a couple of dusty joints over time. The highway, the highway to uh, L.A. was was just Highway 91. It became known as the Strip later, which, by the way, is not in the city limits of Las Vegas. It's technically still outside the city limits. Everybody, including me, everybody refers to that as Las Vegas. So downtown, it began to attract the El Cortez, which is still in business in downtown Las Vegas. It began to attract. Uh, some New York gangsters, uh, Bugs, Ben Siegel, Bugsy Siegel, Mo Sedway, and and Siegel were 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 friends back in in New York. Meyer Lansky, that whole New York crowd began to infiltrate downtown Las Vegas, in part because of the race wire. And they at that time Nevada was the only you couldn't get results. The bookies from Hot Springs, from the uh, Oakland at Hot Springs, from the racetracks around the country. You couldn't get results without the race wire for betters to find out the results. So they took control of the race wire. And, and that was really how they, being, meaning Siegel, Sedway, and, and, and that crowd, took control of the race wire in downtown Las Vegas. And that's how they really sort of began to infiltrate Las Vegas around World War II. Then in Guy McAfee came over from L.A. He was a vice cop had brothels and, you know, gambling joints. He was a dirty cop. Came over in the, in, in, uh, in, in 46, the summer of 46, opened the Golden Nugget, as you know, as you and I know, downtown. Owned now, by the way, by uh, Tillman Fertitta, who owns the Houston Rockets. But back then, um, it was Guy McAfee started that. And then, you know, over time, other owners, Steve Wynn owned it at one point. So, in not long after the Golden Nugget opened downtown by McAfee, out on the the highway to L.A., now known as the Strip, Siegel took over from a kind of a 
compulsive gambler, guy who had the Hollywood Reporter newspaper, you know, kind of a Hollywood insiders. It's, it's by the way, it's still in existence. It's kind of a Hollywood, what's going on with the movie? And so the guy was a guy named Billy Wilkerson. He had problems with gambling. And 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 so he sort of he sort of fell apart under him and and Siegel muscled him out. And Siegel took over the construction of the Flamingo, finished it up in night December 1946. He opened the Flamingo. And that really sort of brought a new, there were already a couple of resorts on the strip now known as a strip there were already a couple there but this was sort of a new glamorous type place the flamingo is still where it was in 1940 now none of the original buildings remain the last one was knocked down in 1993 the owners at the time said the operators at the time said we don't want to be associated with a murderer and a rapist it's that was 93 since then the way las vegas has approached what the mob was is different now they understand that there's a lot of interest so that's how it all uh, blossomed, Renee. It, it became, you know, once Siegel got the Flamingo going, again, there were some other places on the Strip. Now known as the Strip. But that really sort of kicked it off, brought a lot of Hollywood celebrities over. And then you know how it goes. Over time, in the late 50s, you had Sinatra and the Rat Pack in the early 60s at the Copa Room and the Sands. And so, you know, over time, it became sort of ground zero for all that Hollywood entertainment and big name acts. That's how it really sort of exploded. Right. Yeah. No question. Um, and it does seem like after Ben Siegel decided to to go with his vision, so to speak, it seemed like the mob then just took over the strip and took all, took over everything Vegas twice. Well, and you hit it. You 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 really hit it. And that's where you know into the seventies you had Frank Rosenthal came from Chicago. Tony Spilatro came from Chicago. But you also had different families had a piece of different casinos you had saint the saint louis mob was involved the detroit mob was involved um the cleveland mob you so you had the 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 mob involved from different cities who had a, a piece of different casinos now the chicago mob you know it sort of picked up a violence when they all really sort of took over some of the key places um you, i know the the tropicana i know we'll talk about that it's about to closed permanently but at that time the kansas city mob had a piece of the tropicana one of the people who controlled the skim meaning the money before it was taxed was was taken off by the mob and sent to kansas city or chicago or whatever one of those guys and another person were heard on a on a video uh surveillance video in kansas city talking about the skim all that was in the 70s and that's when it really began to pick up that was a kansas city mob chicago mob came into the stardust which had already been controlled by the other mobsters but the chicago mob came into there rosenthal took that over that was argent corp they had four casinos around town one of them by the way still in operation downtown to fremont now it's, it's owned by a corporation but yeah so as you noted the chicago mob came in and it got it got violent. You know, you had cars getting blown up. You had people getting killed. You had, you know, and, and that was sort of the image, the whole Sin City image of, you know, mob violence and topless dancing in the casinos and all this sort of sort of rough edged Las Vegas back in those days. Right. Uh, it, the the sense of that time, there was an edge to, to Las Vegas at that time. Um, and I'm so glad you brought up the trop. I am uh, taking a trip out there soon. What are your thoughts? Uh, I know this is a big, big thing going on right now. The TROP is going to be closing here soon. What are your thoughts about the TROP closing and it being pretty much demolished for a baseball field? Well, I want to get your your take on it, too. But, you know, and, you know, Renee, and and, and I, I love uh, that that you're in the group, the Las Vegas Mafia history page we have with a lot of, you know, it's got it's got former mobsters and, and gaming control people and a lot of people talking about what's going on in Las Vegas. And you and you do have a group of people who miss the old Las Vegas when when, you know, it was, it was low table limits, cheap buffets, um, you know, you you you. You, you could get a cheap room because they made the money from gambling. Now, that's the sort of the older law. 1989, Steve Wynn opened the Mirage, the first mega resort really on the Strip. And then it just created this explosion, no pun intended. They got rid of all, all the old mob joints, the Riviera, the Stardust, the Sands, the Dunes. All those were imploded. The Bellagio was built where the Dunes were. So, so you, you had a transition after 89 from 
those kind of mob run joints, low table limits, cheap food, you'd get comp to shows to now, which is corporate controlled, um, making more money really off of conventions and amenities like food than in gambling. So you get a big dispute over, I love old Vegas and hate new Vegas. I, a lot of people don't, didn't know old Vegas. So I love new Vegas. You get all that debate. I love them both. And so, you know, it's sad to me that the trop is going to be gone. Um, it's the last circus circus Caesars, Slots of Fun are about the last ones with original construction in place on the Strip after the Trop is gone. Opened in 1957. Really, all the mobsters who, you know, you had uh, Johnny Rosselli, uh, Carlos Marcello, uh, uh, Frank Costello, Nick Savella, all those mobsters had some sort of relationship with the Trop. Uh, you mentioned Frank Rosenthal the De Niro character in Casino, he lived there for a while. Jerry, his the Sharon Stone character, was a dancer at the trial. Mario Puzo and, and, and Francis Ford Coppola wrote the script to the first Godfather at the trial. They would go downstairs, lose so much money on the tables. Now, I'm a cheap guy. I lose 10, 20 bucks, and I, I go into depression. But these guys were losing 10, $20,000 back then. So, so the history of that place is so valuable, but, but the facts of the matter are Las Vegas is, is having to reposition itself. As you know, there are a thousand casinos, only four states in the country don't have tribal or commercial casinos, South Carolina, Georgia, Utah, and Hawaii. So there are, there are casinos all over the country, beautiful casinos, great horse tracks, lower cost, great food, low table limits, free parking. So the incentive to go to Las Vegas, New York City is about to get three casinos. Dallas, at some point, you know, Mark Cuban's trying to selling the uh, the Mavs to uh, to a Las Vegas family. At some point, Texas will get sports betting, will get casino. Houston's the fourth largest city in the country. So you got a lot of you got a lot of competition now. You you don't have to go to Las Vegas to get a great experience. So. Las Vegas is position, repositioning itself as, as, as the sports capital of the world. So, you know, the Raiders now over to Legion, you know, I remember when the Knights came in, people were like, oh, nobody's going to like hockey in Vegas. They love it in Vegas, won the Stanley Cup. So the A's going to Las Vegas, I'm on board with that. I mean, it's, it's a part of how Las Vegas is, is reshaping itself. It's not the old Las Vegas of the Stardust and Sands days anymore. It's just not that. Yeah, no, it, it's not, and I don't think we'll ever see an era like that. Uh, and I'm with you. It's sad to see the Trop leave. Uh, no question. Who wants to see uh, uh, an iconic casino just not be there anymore? But, like you said, because of the time change and how um, experiences can be found so easily next to you, um, I am a big fan of uh, the baseball stadium being on the strip. I'm a big baseball fan. I'm a Yankee fan. I can't wait <laughs> to the Yankees uh, go in and schedule their, uh, their, their, their away games. I am going to be there. Uh, so I, I do look forward to that little transition. Um, I understand there's going to be a casino attached to the, to the ballpark. So uh, go, go get your bets, go, go get your, uh, your bets in, get yourself a, a, a beer and a hot dog and enjoy a game. Best ballpark in the country. I, I mean, I, you know, and you know, this is a Yankees guy. Now this is more a Mets thing, but you know, uh, up near uh, uh, the, 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 I almost said uh, Shea, but up near in Queens where the Mets play, there's an effort to get a casino there. So yeah. So, so a ballpark on the strip with the A's now, you know, the A's aren't very good right now. They've had a history of success. It went from Philly to Kansas city to Oakland. So this will be another stop for them, but I hope the last stop, but I, I'm with you. I mean, wouldn't it be nice? Somebody said on the Las Vegas mafia history page the other day, wouldn't it be nice? You know, that glass ceiling at, at the trop, which is gorgeous. I think back to the ballpark where the Padres play in San Diego, you know, how that left field wall, they were so smart to do that. They built the, downtown they built the park and they left that old warehouse standing and put seats in it so wouldn't it be nice if they kept part of the trop like a wall or, or somehow incorporated that ceiling took it down but put it in a part of the ballpark just just make people know that's where the trop was and and as they build out a new casino maybe put it there 
fan, and you would think maybe maybe in between the ballpark and the casino, there'll be a little hallway to walk through, and why not? Why not go down memory lane? I know it'd be a, a sight to see. It's one of it's one of the main reasons why I want to go. Uh, I love the, the way uh, the shop looks inside with that ceiling. Oh, um, and yeah, well, what a nice little connection it would be uh, to get to the ballpark from the sports betting area and then have a trip down memory lane and just look up. Such a smart idea. Such a smart idea. I love your, I love that idea. Somebody suggested taking that ceiling down and selling pieces. I love your idea better, you know, because somehow connect that ballpark to the place where the Godfather was written and, and Rosenthal, the, the De Niro character that once lived and, and where, I mean, pull that part of Las Vegas history into that ballpark. Man, I love your idea. Wouldn't it be really nice if that glass ceiling somehow were in some sort of hallway, Renee? Wouldn't that be awesome? I don't right, know. No, you... Nobody said what they're going to do with it. Right, right. There's, there's no word yet. Uh, I know I'm going to go... Uh... You know, just go go ask around when I go to the shop. You know what what the word is, uh, and because I, you know, as you know, with the Riviera and a, a, a lot of other casinos, um, you know, they sell the the, the items, and and I'd be really interested to, to to know what they're doing with that. Um, no question. I'd buy a piece of it. Remember, uh, I want to say, uh, oh, I don't know, three or four years ago, while most of the mob connected casinos on the strip that have construction in place. Now the Flamingo is still there, as we said, but none of the original buildings remain. The El Cortez, the Fremont, uh, the Texan Benny Binion at, at the Horseshoe. There are still some places downtown in operation, but remember about three or four years ago uh, at the El Cortez, which again was owned in part by, Greece, by Gus Greenbaum and, and Ben Siegel. And so it has a lot of mob history. They, removed the carpet they replaced the carpet and remember they they sold patches of that carpet i think it was like 100 bucks or something wouldn't it be really nice if i'm i'm on board with buying uh some sort of memento or something from if they do something like that with the trop but do something to give people a piece of history right to hold on to 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 well like i say preserve history right mm -hmm. um absolutely I, I would definitely love to have a piece of that history um there's so much behind it I'm so glad you brought up Benny Benny. He intrigues me in a time era where there was mobsters all over. <laughs> Did he ever associate with a certain network like a New York mob, the, the Chicago mob? It seemed like he just went, in the, went into Nevada and just started running his own shop, basically. Well, I know you had Doug Swanson on. His book is the book to read on oh. Benny. Fascinating. Now there's a there's a statue, a horse statue to to, to Benny down at the South Point in uh, at the southern end of the strip. A legendary figure in Las Vegas. He was his own person in downtown Las Vegas. A lot of the Texas guys hung out there. Uh, you know the Doyle Bronsons, a lot of the poker guys, and in those days, a lot of those guys were Texas guys. Um, you know, it, it's. Uh, I, I want to tell a real quick story about that. But first, you know, it, it was kind of a hangout. Jimmy Chagra from El Paso, the marijuana uh, trafficker, used to hang out there. In fact, um, allegedly uh, 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 a guy named Charles Har Harrelson, who's the actor's dad, had a business card that said Hitman on it that he passed out to people at the at the horseshoe, now known as Binion's, even though the family doesn't own it. But anyway... There's a great book out. I highly recommend to everybody. It just came out about a year or so ago. Billy Walters, one of the legendary sports bettors, probably the most successful ever, from Kentucky, from Louisville, went to Las Vegas. And around that era, when when Benny Benyon and Billy Walters, the game, a lot of those up, uh, Doyle Brunson, a lot of those uh, great poker stars also did some booking on the side and stuff like that. So Billy Walter's book, he talks about an incident where Tony Spilatro would shake down these poker guys and gals, uh, Stu Unger and other people like that. You had So Benny Binion tells Billy Walters, if I'm getting this anecdote right out of the book, great book, by the way, it's called Gambler. Uh, there's something about life at the risk, life uh, uh, at risk. Great, great book. And it really captures that era. But Benny Binion told Walters, the one when Walters got to town, the one guy you got to be careful of is is, is Tony Spilatro. He's going to shake you down and you either pay him or he's going to kill you. No. Now, 
so so Walt so so Benny the way it's been told is not in Walter's book but elsewhere that crowd didn't fool with Benny downtown the guys out on the strip Benny was a tough old Texan man and and they didn't fool with him so Benny had a little meeting had a sit down with with, with some of those guys and asked Spilatro to leave leave Billy and these guys alone I'm 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 summarizing I'm paraphrasing so, you know, they didn't really fool with him too much. He had his own game downtown and they had their game out on the strip and some other joints downtown, but they didn't really fool. They didn't really cross him too much. He, he, and he didn't, he didn't affiliate with the Chicago mob or the Kansas city mob. He had his own, his own game down at the horseshoe. And so, so, you know, everybody sort of knew you don't really want to fool with Benny. No, I mean, the, the the reputation that he had, you know, it, it strung from Texas to to Nevada to Montana to, I mean, who knows if those bodies from Lake Mead have his name <laughs> on it, you know? Uh, you know, he was just a fascinating figure in a time where the mob was just everywhere. And how did this individual leave Texas and just go make, and it it, it just seemed like he was just ruthless enough to, to make it with him. Tough guy. And you had Doug Swanson on talking about that. He was just a tough guy. You know, he came, it was a different era and it was, it was that world post-World War II era, tough guy from Dallas. You know, he had some bodies back in Dallas, had that big uh, feud with that guy, Noble. Um, And he, and and he, so he, and he knew the gambling game a lot. You know, funny thing about it is a lot of the people who came to Nevada after gambling was legalized in the thirties, but especially picked up after World War II, came from places like Frank Rosenthal came from places where gambling was illegal. And so when they went out to Nevada, suddenly they were, they were the ones who knew how to run gambling joints. They knew how to handle the odds, how to look for cheaters, how to, how to, how to train the, the, you know, the pit bosses and the car dealers. And so they were the ones who knew how to do it. And so when they came to Las Vegas, and Benny was one of those guys, when they came out to Las Vegas, they were the ones who knew how to make the games work. You know, he introduced free drinks, and I don't know if he was the first one to do that, but he he sort of, you know, uh, 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 made made the gaming establishments attractive to gamblers who knew what, the, you know, he had, he had max limits, man. I mean, people could go in there. There was a famous guy who he ended up, I think, committing suicide. He went in there and I think, a, I don't remember what the role was. It was like $700,000 on the, on the, on the table. I mean, he, it was wide open Texas crazy gambling in, in, in at the horseshoe. Yeah. That was Benny's thing. He loved the, uh, he would take any bets, no matter what size, uh, the bigger, the better to him. He didn't. And, and what was funny, he didn't even care if he lost. <laughs> you know it was so funny it's like he knew that the next big bet he would win and get it back somehow it just he never seemed to have a worry about the the, the size of the bet he welcomed it all he um, knew and, the and, math fa- the math favors the the house and he would sit in that uh there was a coffee shop he, he had a, he had a famous recipe for chili from the Texas from the dallas prison allegedly and he would sit in a corner booth and dispense wisdom and and um it, it was just such so, well, and, and you hit it. It was it was such a different era. Now it's the it, it's the corporate. Nothing wrong with those people. I don't. I'm not opposed to corporate casinos. Howard Hughes came in the late '60s, bought up a lot of the the mob joints, and I would I would by the way credit a lot of the reporters who blew the whistle on on the mob on the, the guys like Ned Day, Jane Morrison, great reporter who George Knapp, Jeff Garman, uh, Jeff, real good friend of mine. Jeff was killed a couple of years ago, not a mob thing, but uh, he, he was attacked by the mob back when he was covering, a, uh, you know, the mob. But anyway, a lot of those reporters back then also uncovered a lot of that. So you had Howard Hughes, you had corporate gaming come in, you had some tough reporters. So all those things conspired to sort of push the mob out. But back before all that, it was just a different breed. And, and a lot of the ones who ended up there were people who knew gambling elsewhere. So that's how, and then the community accepted those people. They gave them awards. These were people who were criminals uh, where they came from. And then when they, they get to Las Vegas and they're, you know, person of the year and all that stuff. Yeah, no question. I mean, that, 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 what, what a weird scenario for them, huh? Um, and in your time as a journalist, did you have any run-ins 
with, with mob figures, good or bad. I didn't. You know, it, it was funny. Back when I was a reporter in Las Vegas and, and worked for the governor, um, as a reporter, I was a political editor at The Sun and, and covered the politics up in Reno. I was I was a political reporter. So there was a, there was intersection between what was happening in the political world and the, and the mob and gaming world. But I was really more focused on politics. When I went for the went to work for the governor, his dad had been a uh, a bookie up in Chicago and had come down to Las Vegas. He was another one of those second generation people whose 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 family had been involved in you know illegal bookmaking and thing. Had a burlesque show up in Chicago. Came down to Las Vegas. He, he was a partner of Carl Thomas, who, who ultimately was involved in uh, in 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 you know the, he was one of the ones heard on tape in Kansas City talking about how the skim works. It's lots of fun. The Riviera. He ran the Riviera. So that generation of people who came to Chicago, um, I mean, I'm sorry, I came to Las Vegas. The next generation is like the guy I work for. Not at all involved with the mob. They were. He went to law school and was a district attorney in in Las Vegas, busting you know criminals. So. No, the 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 only sort of you, you know you, you you would you would see uh, people from in bars and stuff and you know they're so and so and uh, friends of mine like Jeff Garman, he and I would hit would hit some of the bars and Jeff had covered all of them and knew some of them, but it, it was I covered a different world back in those days. Would see them, would you know every now and then would would you, you know maybe say hi if 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 you were walking in and out of somewhere, but I didn't really cover those guys. Yeah, no question. And being in Arkansas, I I know Hot Springs has their uh history. Can you still? I, I know you've been out to Hot Springs. Uh, can you still feel the aura and the understanding oh. of why Hot Springs was just a was such a hot spot for illegal love, gambling? Love Hot Springs from everybody from Al Capone. It was a hands off place, like Las Vegas was too back in the day. You could be from Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis. You don't kill it. You don't you don't fight and kill in, in Hot Springs or Las Vegas. It's, it's sort of, you know, uh, 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 no fire zone. But Hot Springs was that way. Uh, you know, Dutch Schultz, uh, uh, they all went out there. Ben Siegel, Frank Costello, they all went to Hot Springs because it was wide open, wide open, illegal, but wide open casinos, prostitutes. All that vice was just wide open. The cops were on the payroll and that sort of thing. Lucky Luciano was arrested in the 30s in Hot Springs, walking down the street with the head of detectives. And a New York detective who was in Hot Springs looking for another bad guy saw Luciano and they arrested him and took him back to, to New York for prostitution. So, yeah, Hot Springs was just wide open. Just, you know, public corruption, public corruption. You can't have the underworld unless the overworld's corrupt. And so they they ran those, the, they ran those. Yeah, you could definitely still feel it. Now, one of the things, too, in Hot Springs that was there when those mob guys were there is back, you know, hundred more than a hundred years, I think, is is a really famous horse track called Oaklawn, which to this day, as you know, the Arkansas Derby is one of the big prelude races to the the Triple Crown. So Oaklawn is still there, great horse track, now has a legal casino attached to Oaklawn. There are three legal casinos in Arkansas now. Uh, sports betting is legal in Arkansas um, on, you know, their, their apps, you, you, you know, so the 38 states it's legal. So yeah, hot springs. In fact, we, when we started the mob summit back in 2018 in Las Vegas, the next year we had it in hot springs. Now then COVID hit. And so we, we, we sort of put it aside, but yeah, we, we hot springs a guy named Robert range runs a, ga uh, a gangster museum in hot springs. It's a great town. Great town. You can definitely still feel the aura. And there is legal gambling there now at Oakland. Great place. Hey, it's nice they moved on from the illegal gambling to the legal gambling. <laughs> Unfortunately, here in Texas, we don't have that yet. Uh, but like like the Hot Springs area, you know, here in Texas, we had the Galveston, the Dallas area. Um, but of course, you had San Antonio, uh, Houston, El Paso, um, Lubbock, Amarillo. Um, there are stories from all over, uh, and then that's the beauty about this. I got into this with collecting chips from from traveling to Vegas, and all of a sudden I found out chips had stories. And wow, there are so many of them. And as you know, we tell them every day on on your uh, Facebook page. Uh, you know, you know, I, I there's such a fascination that comes with illegal gambling and mobsters that I, I can't get enough. 
You know, and, what, what's your first? Nobody your, can get enough of it. Well, I, and, and I got to ask you this, you know, I, at gambling.com, you know, I, I've done a couple of stories where I've talked to Mattress Mac, as you know, in Houston, uh, runs a gallery furniture, uh, not far from where you are. Great guy, real, super big Astros fan, uh, Houston Cougars guy. He's got a million bucks on the Cougars to win this year's <laughs> tourney. Mac goes over, as you know, everything's geofence now. So like Louisiana's legal, Arkansas legal, Oklahoma doesn't have legal sports betting, but has the world's largest casino just north of Dallas. Right. So Mac goes over. He literally drives over the state line into Louisiana. I think it's what hour and a half or so from Houston, maybe two hours. Right. Drives over the state line where the geofence. So and then he gets on his app and places some bets. And so at some point, in Texas, and I know uh, as again, I, I mean, Cuban Jerry Jones, Tilma Fertitta, who owns the Rockets, Tilma Fertitta, Landry's Inc. owns the Golden Nugget casino chain. So at some point, when I'm thinking, you know, and it's not just Mac. A lot of people go over from Texas. A good friend of mine is is a sports book manager of casinos up in Shreveport. A lot of people from the Dallas Fort Worth metroplex. At some point, Texas. There's some tax money lost. Is there a sense? I, I got to ask you this because you know the street in Texas. Is there a sense at some point in Austin, the cap at some point is the legislature going to say, let's put this to a public vote? I think the people would vote for it. We as the people would love for it to be <laughs> a people's vote. I'll tell you that. Uh, you know, I had a, a illegal gaming uh, expert on here, uh, episode three or four. Um, he primarily does a lot of Texas illegal gambling, and him and I share so much knowledge back and forth. Here in Texas, you know, they'll vote to have their guns every day of the week, but they won't vote in a casino. It does not make sense to me. We have, like you said, the fourth largest city in Houston. Then you have the Dallas-Fort Worth metro Metroplex that has so much gambling history. Benny Binion, who is on a Mount Rushmore of figures of Las Vegas, in my opinion. Then you have San Antonio, Amarillo, El Paso, that you I mean you're sharing a border with uh with New Mexico and Mexico that I mean there is so many opportunities. Uh What's that the I just don't up? understand. What's the is it the legislature is just kind of controlled by is it is it religious factions, conservative factions, just anti-gaming uh, gaming factions or I think you could put all three of those in a hat. And it makes it makes sense. It is gonna, it's going to be a little bit religious, a little conservative. Um, I've also want to put, put in my mind that what does Louisiana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma have to say about this too? They would lose so much money if Texas has casinos because I've been to these casinos in these other these other states. They're filled with Texas license plates. So I think that there's a little bit of pull from these outside states that have a little bit of say in this too, not just necessarily. The Texas pool. Does that make a little sense? I think you're completely right. In fact, a friend of mine told me I was talking to somebody, a friend of mine the other day, uh, and you hit the nail on the head about Oklahoma too. Yeah, and Louisiana, you you're going to get some some uh behind the scenes uh, uh stream pulling. Uh my understanding is all the casinos in in Oklahoma are tribal casinos, and my understanding is the tribal uh, uh casino uh, executives already are working to sort of keep uh, casino gambling illegal in, 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 in Texas, because clearly if Dallas, the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, Matt, and you know, this, you got the Rangers, you got the Cowboys, you got the stars, you got the Mavericks, you got, it's such a big sports area and you know, everybody and Houston is, I mean, it, it, it would really hurt those surrounding states. However, the opposite is true too. If I'm a lawmaker in Austin, I'm thinking 2025 is the next time they meet. So we're still back to kick the can down the road. Then you got to have a public vote. So it's going to be a while. But with Cuban, Jerry Jones, Tilma Fertitta, with people like that behind it, at some point, the money lost to other states, somebody's got to say, guys, we need schools. We need roads. We need uh, infrastructure bridges. Uh, we got to pay for this stuff. And do we raise property taxes? Do we raise sales? One of the bills last session would have put four casinos in, 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 I think the governor at the time, Abbott was saying, you know what, we don't want to be the whole state to be over. But at the time, I think the bill had Houston, 
Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, San Antonio, and Austin, a casino in each of those places, four casinos. And it, it, it makes it makes sense. Uh, I, I mean, it makes nothing but sense. But like I said, and fortunately, I do believe that the higher powers to be with their pockets, um, their pocketbooks are going to say no. And like you said, they're, they're pushing it in Oklahoma for it to be a, a, a no gambling state here in Texas. Uh, I don't know what it's going to take, if ever, honestly, Larry, to, 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 to get casinos to really make that jump. If we get one, I mean, there's one down in Eagle Pass, Texas. Right, we have tribal, one down, tribal, tribal uh, casino. I think right. there are three, two or three tribal casinos. Right, and and, and I mean that one has a, a poker table, a poker room, no other table games. I, 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 it's a big slot machine casino, great casino for, for for slot machine players. I like table, you know, I like a roulette table, I like a blackjack table, um, and, and quite frankly, I just like a, a nice casino where I can go pick my game at sometimes. Uh, I, and, I do too. And, I, yeah. and I, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get that uh, if we're, for quite some time, if ever. Here. And I love the sports books. You know, you go and and I'm a low, low, low better guy. I'm an $11 guy. I'm a $22 guy. You know, go, go, go sit down, have a, have an adult beverage, watch the games. And, you know, I'm not talking about betting twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. I couldn't even if I wanted to. I'm, but just that there's an atmosphere that's enjoyable. Do, do you think there will ever get to the point where there's uh you know, somebody said, well, walking into a casino, they could see you do that. But if you have online sports betting, you know, you could be anywhere. And nobody, I mean, do you think it'll ever, what what will come first in Texas? Do you think they'll do online mobile on, on apps? Or do you think no, no casino, but let's do mobile sports betting? I think if they'll do anything first, it'll, they'll try the app. They'll try the mobile sports betting uh, where you can, you know, place your bets online, um, for any games, any races, uh, you know, even the, the coin flip of the Super Bowl you could bet on, you know. Uh, I'm sure that if, if, if anything, that will come first to, to give like a test run. But then it, it, from what I don't get, once you give it a test, a test run and you see the financial gain, then what's the hold up for the next step and just saying, all right, let's just put up a sports book slash casino. Um, because the, 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 the money's there. Um, and there's so much good that you can get from these casinos to give back to the state, the community, the city, you know, so much, you know, you know what casinos can do for, for, for a city or a town. And it's, it's uh, for lawmakers, you know, you do have pushback. One of the lawmakers in the Senate running it in Kentucky was telling me, you know, it's just really hard to get some of the, some of the, some of the anti-gaming uh, gaming factions, because there is some issue with some, some betters are problem gamblers and all that nine parishes in Louisiana. You can't do it because they didn't vote for it. So you do have some pushback understandably, but um, the other side of the coin is if you're a legislator and you raise property taxes, you raise sales taxes, you raise any other kind of tax, the argument for gaming, and this was in Nevada is it's a it, one way of putting it is it's a voluntary tax. You you can choose to do that, and it raises an enormous amount of tax money for things like schools, roads, and all that. Now, property taxes, sales taxes, those aren't voluntary. I mean, you got to pay those, but you don't have to get onto an app and bet on sports. You don't have to go into a casino. So, you know, by and large, it's hard to win. It's recreational. It's like the 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 head of FanDuel was saying, and Billy Walters, I think, was saying this. The uh, uh, we were talking earlier about Billy Walters. For most people, betting is recreational. Most people bet twenty bucks on sports. I think the I think the numbers show. Um, you know, you get some big heavy hitters, but most people, it's just fun and recreational. They're not going to bet the house, and so, but it does raise a lot of tax money. It makes it easier for legislators to do that than it is to raise another kind of tax. Right, right, and and people getting their taxes raised, mm. they don't. They, they, yeah, yeah, you, you know, they, they're not going to be for that, you know. Uh, so it, it doesn't. It makes more sense to to just start putting up a casino or two, or like you said, just put start with a sports book. Start with a sports book. See what that looks like, and if you want to even try the apps, we'll try the apps first. But we, uh, I would like them to try something. Uh, it's better than and look. It, 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 I'm not saying that we can't gamble at all here, right? There, there's poker rooms. I live in Austin. I live, you know, 20 minutes from four or five. So I'm not 
saying I can't go gamble. But there's nights I just don't want to go play poker. I want I want a roulette table. You know, that that's my game of choice, to be honest. I, I like a good gamble. And roulette has that honest gamble. You put your money down, get your adult beverage, and, and let it fly. Enjoy yourself. You know, it's that's right. Yeah. And, and you know what the truth is? And you know this. Right now in Austin, Houston, Dallas, Amarillo, Lubbock, wherever you are, right now, you can get onto an app. It's just illegal. And so all that, or like you can do like Mac does. And, you know, from Houston, from Dallas, you can just drive over into Louisiana and, and you know. And by the way, you look at a place like, and, and you know the geography. You, 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 you look at Louisiana. You got Shreveport and Bossier up in the Northwest. You got New Orleans, Baton Rouge. Lake Charles, which is the closest in Southwest Louisiana to the Texas border, Houston. And, you know, that whole area, San Antonio, Austin, uh, the biggest gaming market in Louisiana that raises the most revenue from gaming is not New Orleans, not Baton Rouge. It's, it's Lake Charles and the casinos in Lake Charles. And, there, and then there's a racetrack in, in Vinton, even between Houston and Lake, which you can play slots and you can go bet on sports on your phone. But, you know, if you haven't been to Lake Charles, and I keep saying this all the time, when you go around the country and look at how casinos are, how nice they are, the, the, the casinos in Lake Charles are just super nice. Golf courses, beautiful casinos. Um, it, it's just right across the border for Texans. Beautiful casinos. Yeah, La Burge, the Golden oh, Nugget. I oh. stayed at the at the Horseshoe. The They just opened that one recently. I mean, so new that, it, that there's restaurants that aren't open yet but yeah. it's so nice there yeah. um they, they, they've done well uh, at, at lake charles like you said the golf courses that the food the experience and yeah us uh, us texans we love gambling so we're gonna fill up those parking lots left and right <laughs> you, know, every, you know what i think part of it is too and you, you know i'm a i'm a i'm a nevada guy man so i'm not downing nevada but part of it too is i think Back in those old mob days, cars blowing up and, you know, you see it in the movie Casino and got the golf. So one of the arguments you'll hear in some states that are anti-gaming, well, we don't want to be another Las Vegas. They're, they're talking about the old Las Vegas. They're talking about no cars are going to blow up. No mob guys in Austin or Houston are going to take people out and bury them in a... But that image, the there's not a... There's not legal prostitution in Las Vegas. There is in Nevada, but but that image you hear, well, we don't want prostitution and mob, and that's 1970s and earlier Las Vegas. But that whole mob Sin City image, which is not the current Las Vegas, by the way, it's a great convention city, and but some of those lawmakers and some of those places use that to 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 derail gaming in their states i i think it's that old image of las vegas especially if, if you and think about this too larry right you like you said they're bringing up an old vegas that we're talking decades ago decades and then you're talking about the, you, like you said they, they talk prostitution they talk drugs they talk violence well let's let's talk about the cities you want to put this up on you want to you want to talk houston there that's there you want to talk putting a casino in dallas that's there so it's not going to bring anything that's not there already so again, the, 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 you can, can you can continue lying, but the facts are whatever you you're saying, it's in the state, it's in the cities that are talked about putting casinos up anyways, big time, and 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 so when people say we don't want another Las Vegas, my 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 my, my take is why not? It is a booming city with every major sports team. NBA is not there yet, and the A's are coming, but the NBA is going to be there. It's a dynamic city. It's got world-class restaurants. It's got world-class facilities. Every convention in the world wants to have their, their convention. What? So when you say we don't want to be another Las Vegas, yeah, you do. They get 45 million tourists a year. They get as many tourists as people live in Canada and California. Why wouldn't you want to be another Las Vegas? 4.2 miles is the number one tourist destination in the world. That why not look Macau's doing it and Macau now is becoming that destination for gamblers, other collectors like myself. You know, once we tap out the well here in Vegas or anywhere else that we're going to collect from, well, Macau has now what's the new Vegas and and why not look at it? it, it it's it, it's blowing up over there.
Yeah, it's not that old mobbed up uh, Sin City stuff. And but I but I do think that that is what a lot of people who haven't been to the new Las Vegas and all that I, they use that to try to hurt you know, gambling bills. And I know some of that happens in Texas. I've heard some of the lawmakers say that that we don't want to be another Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah you do. Go ask Mark Cuban. Go ask. Mark yeah, Cuban. you do. Right. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a family oriented place. This past this past December, we took our kids. I mean, you talk about movie theaters, buffets, ice skating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at, at the Treasure Island, you have the Avengers uh, little museum that you can go see. I mean, sugar factories for kids to go eat candy, Hershey World. I mean, it, this is this is not the mob ran town where you know Tony the Ant's going to come no. out and, and and start shooting <laughs> up the strip. You know, <laughs> you know this is well, <laughs> you know you got orchestras, you got. It, it it's yeah it it's not you're not gonna worry you don't have to worry about Robert De Niro and uh, and uh, Joe Pesci uh, uh, putting a gun to your head no 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 you don't you don't have to worry about you know uh, yeah it, it's just but anyway I mean it, it just takes a time of the twelve states with schools in the southeastern conference including Texas with Texas A and M and now UT's coming in with with the Longhorns Oklahoma I'm counting they're coming in to the SEC. 38 states in the country have legal sports betting. Of the 12 SEC states, the biggest geographic pocket in the country without legal sports betting is six of the SEC states. There's some, and I grew up in Louisiana. I'm not downing the South or Southwest. Believe me. I mean, I, I, I am uh, a son of that area. But that is still the last region where sports betting is taking hold. And I just don't really know why. Half of those states don't have sports betting, including Texas, the second most populated state in the country. Right. I, I, why? And I, again, I do believe religion has a big factor, like you've said, what we mentioned before. Um, but I think that it's just a little bit of everything uh, has to do with it, including other states pulling and buying for other states not to be successful in, in, in passing bills like that. Um, they don't want money coming out of their pocket, and they know, they know for a fact that if casinos start opening up here in Texas, it is a fact, not an opinion, that they will be successful. Oh man, it'll hurt Vegas. It'll hurt Vegas. Um, you know what I think might ultimately push it. You know, not only I mean it's going to be the Tillman Fertitas and the Jerry Joneses, but I think the deal Cuban did, and I'm spitballing, man. And I obviously have no inside information. But I think the deal that Tillman did with with uh, Sheldon Adelson, of course, has died. But his family that, you know, still owns Sands Corp, which doesn't have any casinos. They're based in Las Vegas, but their casinos are in Singapore and Macau now. But they bought the Mavs. And, and the deal is, I think the, the plan is to build a casino slash arena. And I've been in the arena in downtown Dallas where the Mavs play. I've seen the Mavs love it. But I think they want to build a new arena for the Mavs with a casino complex. And I think Cuban, I think if anything sort of tips the scales with the Jerry Joneses and the Tillman for, for, for Titas and, and all that, I, th I think that th those people saying, you know what, we need, I think the Cuban push up in North Texas might sort of push it that way. I don't think they're going to ever bring the Mavs to, da to, to Las Vegas. But if that threat exists, man, you that is have a, them in Dallas. That would be uh, that's leverage. <laughs> that is some good <laughs> leverage to have. Uh, and, and because if that's if that's their ultimate goal, right? And, and you're not going to provide that for them. They know who will, who will, what states will, and, and, and why not make that transition if you have to? It'd be tough to see Dallas Mavericks leave. You know, that, that's, you know, between them, Houston Rockets and the Spurs, they all have titles, you know, so it, it, it would be a tough move for them. And, and it, I know Dallas would be gutted if, they, if the Mavericks oh, left. Man. But what, but as, as a business standpoint, if that's your goal, and we know when you have goals set in stone, you can erase them, but a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. um, you They'll find a way to either get that casino built. Um, or like you said, they'll use it as leverage uh, and, and maybe make their way out to, to Sin City. Yeah, you just don't know. And, and you know, it's such a great sports state. You got the Astros and you got the Rangers won the World Series last year. So it's just a great sports state and got to keep the Mavs in Dallas. But I, I think ultimately it's going to be something like that 
because you know at the end of the day money talks and bs walks and when you got the tillman fertitas and the and the mark cubans and the jerry jones as jerry jones himself has said on a radio show and, and elsewhere i think he said that sports betting is ultimately going to happen in texas and one of the things too in, in states like missouri where the cardinals and the and the royals and the blues and all those people are trying to get sports betting on the the and and same thing in georgia the the hawks and the falcons and the braves are, are in an alliance trying to get it in georgia too because they form alliances with these sports betting companies and there's some revenue involved so they the, the, those teams see the revenue involved too in being aligned with, with with sports betting operations and i think you see people like cuban jerry Joe, people like that see you know what there's some money on the table here that we need to keep yeah, no, no question. It'd be nice to keep. There is no question about that. Uh, Larry, thank you so much, brother, for your time. I can't thank you enough. Uh, can you let everybody know how they can follow you on your platforms? I know you're on social media left and right. Uh, let them know how they can follow you, brother. Let it fly. Well, uh, at News Larry Henry on X, Twitter. Uh, gambling.com is who I work for. I'm always writing stuff for gambling.com. Please join Las Vegas Mafia History and Mob Summit Facebook pages. And please, I would love to see everybody. We, 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 we're starting the Mob Summit back up. Tommy Canale out in Las Vegas. Uh, uh, Frank Calabrese is going to be there. Sal Polisi is going to be there. Um, at Dom DeMarco's Pizzeria out by the ballpark, out by Red Rock, where the, where the aviators play. Um, June 1st, uh, Mob Summit is kicking back off. Love to see everybody come out to the Mob Summit. That's awesome. I can't wait to see you out there at the Mob Summit. Larry, thank you so much again for being on. It was a pleasure. Take care, brother. We'll talk to you soon. Great conversation. I appreciate you having me on. Anytime. Take care, brother. Take, take care.